Hey Antlers, it's Miss Crab, and today is First Chapter Friday yet again. I'm so excited to be sharing this new read with you guys. Um, I actually have my very own copy at home aside from classroom copy of it, um, and I just started about three days ago. Have not finished it yet, but so far so good. It's really good read. So, um, hopefully me reading the first chapter today will get you a little bit excited and make you want to pick the book up and read it for yourself. So, I'm going to read the inside cover real quick, and then we're going to begin chapter one. All right, here we go. Glittering. That's how Katie Takashima's sister, Lynn, makes everything seem. The sky is Kira Kira because its color is deep but see-through at the same time. The sea is Kira Kira for the same reason, and so are people's eyes. When Katie and her family move from a Japanese community to Iowa, to the deep south of Georgia, it's Lynn who explains to her why people stop them on the street to stare. And it's Lynn who, with her special way of viewing the world, teaches Katie to look beyond tomorrow. But when Lynn becomes de desperately ill and the whole family begins to fall apart, it is up to Katie to find a way to remind them all that there is always something glittering, Kira Kira, in the future. Luminous in its persistence of love and hope, Kira Kira is Cynthia Katohata's stunning debut in middle grade fiction. So, again, this is Kira Kira by Cynthia Katohata. Um, its fiction is genre, I mean, its genre is fiction, um, and it's a John Newberry Medal Award winner. So here we go. Chapter one. My sister Lynn taught me my first word. Kira Kira. I pronounced it as ka a a, but she knew what I meant. Kira Kira means glittering in Japanese. Lynn told me that when I was a baby. She used to take me onto our empty road at night where she would lie on her where we would lie on our backs and look at the stars while she said over and over, Katie say Kira Kira, Kira Kira. I love that word. When I grew older, I used Kira Kira to, to describe everything I liked. The beautiful blue sky, puppies, kittens, butterflies, colored Kleenex. My mother said we were misusing the word. You could not call a Kleenex Kira Kira. She was dismayed over how an un-Japanese, how un-Japanese we were and vowed to send us to Japan one day. I didn't care where she sent me, so long as Lynn came along. I was born in Iowa in 1951. I know a lot about when I was a little girl because my sister used to keep a diary. Today, I keep her diary in a drawer next to my bed. I like to see how her memories were the same as mine, but also different. For instance, one of my earliest memories is of the day Lynn saved my life. I was almost five and she was almost nine. We were playing on the empty road near our house. Fields of tall corn stretched into the distance wherever you looked. A dirty gray dog ran out of the field near us and then he ran back in. Lynn loved animals. Her long black hair disappeared into the corn, into the corn, as she chased the dog. The summer sky was clear and blue. I felt a brief fear as Lynn disappeared into the corn stalks. When she wasn't in school, she stayed with me constantly. Both of our parents worked. Officially, I stayed all day with a lady from down the road, but unofficially, Lynn was the one who took care of me. After Lynn ran into the field, I couldn't see anything but corn. Lenny, I shouted. We weren't that far from our house, but I felt scared. I burst into tears. Somehow or other, Lynn got behind me and said, Boo! I cried some more. She just laughed and hugged me and said, You're the best little sister in the world. I liked it when she said that, so I stopped crying. The dog ran off. We lay on our backs in the middle of the road and stared at the blue sky. Some days, nobody at all drove down our little road. We could have lain on our backs all day and never got hit. Lynn said, the blue of the sky is one of the most special colors in the world because the color is deep but see-through, both at the same time. What did I just say? The sky is special. The ocean is like that too. And people's eyes. She turned her head towards me and waited. I said, the ocean and people's eyes are special too. That's how I learned about eyes, sky, and ocean. The three special, deep-colored, see-through things. I turned to Lenny. Her eyes were deep and black like mine. The dog burst from the field suddenly growling and snarling. Its teeth were long and yellow. We screamed and jumped up. 
The dog grabbed my pants. As I pulled away, the dog ripped my pants and his cold teeth touched my skin. Ah! I screamed. Lynn pulled the dog's tail and shouted at me. Run, Katie, run! I ran, hearing the dog growling and Lenny grunting. When I got to the house, I turned around and saw the dog tearing at Lynn's pants as she huddled over into a ball. I ran inside and looked for a weapon. I couldn't think straight. I got a milk bottle out of the fridge and ran towards Lynn and threw the bottle at the dog. The bottle missed the dog and broke on the street. The dog rushed up to lap the milk. Lynn and I ran towards the house, but she stopped on the porch. I pulled at her. Come on! She looked worried. He's going to cut his tongue on that glass. Who cares? But she got the water hose and chased the dog away with the water so it wouldn't hurt its tongue. That's the way Lynn was. Even if you tried to kill her and bite off her leg, she still forgave you. This is what Lynn said in her diary from that day. The corn was so pretty. When it was all around me, I felt like I wanted to stay there forever. Then I heard Katie crying and I ran out as fast as I could. I was so scared I thought something had happened to her. Later, when the dog attacked me, Katie saved my life. I didn't really see things that way. If she hadn't saved my life first, I wouldn't have been able to save her life. So really, she's the one who saved a life. Lynn was the bravest girl in the world. She was also a genius. I knew this because one day I asked her, are you a genius? And she said yes. I believed her because the day my father taught her how to play chess, she won her first game. She said she would teach me how to play if I wanted. She always said she would teach me everything in the world I needed to know. She said she would be rich someday and buy our parents seven houses, but first they would buy a house for all of us. That wonderful day was not far off. I found this out one afternoon when Lynn pulled me into the kitchen, her eyes shining. I have to show you something, she said. She reached under the refrigerator and pulled out a tray. A worn envelope sat inside. She opened the envelope up and showed me what was inside. Cash. Is that real, I said? Uh-huh. It belongs to mom and dad. It's for our house we're going to buy. We lived in a little rented house in Iowa. I liked our little rented house, but Lynn always told me I would love our very own house. Then we could get a dog, a cat, and a parakeet. Lynn looked at me expectantly. I said, doesn't money belong in a bank? They don't trust the bank. Do you want to count it? She handed me the envelope and I took the money into my hands. It felt damp and cold. One, two, three, I counted to eleven. Eleven hundred dollar bills. I wasn't sure what to think. I found a dollar once in a parking lot. I bought a lot of stuff with that. With eleven hundred dollars, it seemed you could buy anything. I hope, I hope our house is painted sky blue, I said. It will be. She put the money back. They think it's hidden, but I saw mom take it out. Our parents owned a small Oriental Foods grocery store. Unfortunately, there were hardly any Oriental people in Iowa, and the store went out of business shortly after Lynn and I first counted the money under the refrigerator. My father's brother, my uncle, worked in a poultry hatchery in Georgia. He said he could get my father a job at the hatchery, and he said he could get my mother a job working in a poultry processing factory. A few weeks after the store went out of business, my father decided to take us down to Georgia to join the poultry industry. So we owned, we owed uncle a big favor for helping us. Katsu means triumph in Japanese. For some reason, I always thought triumph and trumpet were the same thing, and I thought of my uncle as a trumpet. Lynn said that our uncle was an odd fish. He was as loud as my father was quiet. Even when he wasn't talking, he had a lot of noise clearing his throat and sniffing and tapping his fingers. Sometimes for no reason that I could see, he would suddenly stand up and clap his hands together really loud. After he got everyone's attention, he would just sit down again. He even made noise when he was thinking. When he was deep in thought, he had a way of turning his ears inside out so that they look kind of deformed. The ears would make a popping sound when they came undone. Lynn said you could hear him thinking, pop, pop. A button-like scar marked one side of Uncle's nose. The story was that when he was a boy in Japan, he was attacked by a giant crows, one of which tried to steal his nose. He, my father, and my mother were Kaibi, which meant that they were born in the United States but were sent to Japan for their education. The crows of Japan are famous for being mean. Anyway, that was the story Lynn told me. It was a sweltering day when our uncle arrived in Iowa to help us move to Georgia. We all ran outside when he heard his truck on our lonely road. 
His truck jerked and sputtered and was generally as noisy as he was. My mother said, will that truck make it all the way to Georgia? My father hit his chest with his fist. That's what he did whenever he wanted to say definitely. He added, he's my brother. Our father was solid and tall, six feet, and our mother was delicate and tiny, four feet ten. As tiny as she was, she scared us when she got mad. Her soft face turned hard and glass-like as it could break into pieces if something hit it. As my parents watched uncle's truck, my father reached out, reached both of his arms around my mother and enveloping her. He stood with her like that a lot as if protecting her, but his being, but his being your brother has nothing to do with whether the truck will make it all the way to Georgia, my mother said. My father said, if my brother says it will make it, then it will make it. He didn't seem to have a doubt in the world. His brother was four years older than he was. Maybe he trusted our uncle the way I trusted Lynn. Lynn whispered to me, Frankly, I wonder whether the truck will make it all the way up the road or to our house, let alone to Georgia. Frankly was her favorite word that week. Our mother looked at us suspiciously. She didn't like it when we whispered. She thought that meant we were gossiping and she was against gossiping. She focused on me. She was trying to read my mind. Lynn said whenever our mother did that, I should try to think nonsense words in my head. I thought to myself, elephant, cow, moo, coo, do, elephant. My mother turned back around to watch the truck. When the truck finally rumbled up, our uncle jumped out and immediately ran towards Lynn and me. I stepped back, but he swooped me up in his arms and shouted, my little Palomeo pony, that's what you are. He twirled me around until I felt dizzy. Then he sat me down and picked up Lynn and twirled her around and said, my little wolfy girl. He sat Lynn down and hugged my father hard. He hugged my mother delicately. While uncle hugged my mother, she turned her face away a bit as if his loudness made her feel faint. It was hard to see how my father and uncle could be related. My father was mild like the sea on a windless day with an unruffled surface and little variation. He was as hard as the wall in our bedroom. Just to prove how strong he was, he used to let us hit him in the stomach as hard as we could. Some days we would sneak up on him and punch him in the stomach and he would never even notice. He would sneak away while we kept listening to the radio as if nothing had happened. My father liked to think. Sometimes Lynn and I would peek at him as he sat at the kitchen table thinking. His hands would be folded on the table and he would be frowning at nothing. Sometimes he would nod, but only slightly. I knew I would never be a thinker like my father because I couldn't sit that still. Lynn said he thought so much that sometimes weeks or even months passed before he made a decision. Once he decided something though, he never changed his mind. He thought many weeks before deciding to move us to Georgia. By the time he decided, there was only $600 in cash left in the envelope under the refrigerator. That night, our uncle arrived in Iowa. He left the dinner table early so that he could go out and take a walk and maybe talk to himself. After the front door closed, my mother said that he was the opposite of my father and that he didn't look before he lipped. Didn't think at all before he made decisions. She lowered her voice and said, that's why he married that woman, meaning his first wife. Strictly speaking, mom was gossiping but who was going to tell her? We all sat silently. My father and uncle were different in other ways. Our uncle liked to talk to anyone, even to himself. My father didn't like to talk except to my mother. He preferred to read the newspaper. My uncle, on the other hand, never read the newspaper. He did not give a hoot what President Eisenhower had to say. My uncle was exactly one inch taller than my father, but his stomach was soft. We knew this because we hit him in it once the year before, and he yelped in pain and threatened to spank us. We got sent to bed without supper because my parents said hitting someone was the worst thing you could do. Stealing was second and lying was third. Before I was 12, I would have committed all three of those crimes. And that is the end of chapter one.